Do you want to put a mark on modern mathematics, but don't want to spend all the time and money earning a PhD? Well, you can ask Patrick LaRoche. In 2018, the Floridian IT professional used the software by GIMPS, or the Great Internet Mercer and Prime Search, to find the largest known prime number as of date. For this, LaRoche goes down in the history of mathematics and has received the $3,000 GIMPS Research Discovery Award. Pretty neat. And really all you need is a computer and a lot of time. After all, these primes are very, very large, so discovering them takes some time. The largest prime number discovered before the most recent one was almost a year prior. So unfortunately, no, most likely you're not going to be the next discoverer of a new big prime number. Though, if you'd like to give it a try, you can download the prime searching softwares for free and look for primes in the comfort of your own home. But how does it work? I mean, obviously, you're not just going to take every number and see if it's prime. That'll take way too long. Okay, well, first things first. How many primes are there? Well, we know there are an infinite number of primes, a proof of which I outlined in a previous video, but how dense are the primes? As in, if I wanted to find the number of primes less than a number, like 1 million, can I use some function or algorithm? Well, not exactly. There's no exact function that will precisely line out the distribution of primes, but there are approximations using asymptotic equivalence. How does this work? Well, first let's define asymptotic equivalence. If two functions of some input are asymptotically equivalent, that means that the limit of the quotient of the two functions as the input goes to infinity is equal to 1. Then, we say that the two functions are asymptotically equivalent as the input goes to infinity. Now, this is a rigorous definition, but in essence, it means that the two functions can approximate each other. Specifically, as the inputs get larger and larger, the approximation gets more and more accurate. So, can we approximate the prime counting function? This function, pi of n, gives us how many primes are less than or equal to n. Again, we don't know this exact function, but if we can find a function that's asymptotically equivalent, then we can approximate how many primes there are below any number we desire. There are a number of these approximating functions, but one of the earliest ones is n over the natural log of n. Well, let's try. Let's approximate how many primes are less than 1 million. Well, 1 million divided by the natural log of 1 million is 72,382. There are exactly 78,498 primes less than 1 million, so not bad. That's less than 8% error. Let's try for 1 billion. There are 50,847,534 primes less than 1 billion. And 1 billion over the natural log of 1 billion is 48,254,942. That's 5% error, so the approximation does get better. As you can probably see, there aren't too many prime numbers. And according to our approximations, the bigger the primes we want to find, the rarer they become. So, how big are we talking? Millions? Billions? Google? Well, it's going to be a little bit bigger than that. How big? Well, Google, 10 to the 100, has 101 digits. A one and then a string of 100 zeros. In comparison, the number of atoms in the observable universe is about 10 to the 80. So a Google is pretty big. In fact, if we use our prime counting number approximation, we can find out the number of prime numbers below 10 to the 100 is about 4.34 times 10 to the 97. Which sounds like a lot, but that's only 0.43% of all the numbers below Google. So, have we found any prime numbers greater than Google? Yes. In 1952, Raphael M. Robinson discovered 2 to the 521 minus 1 to be prime. It has 157 digits, so it's definitely a bit bigger than Google. But that was more than half a century ago. What about now? Are we finding primes with thousands, tens of thousands of digits? Well, let's go back to our friend Patrick LaRoche. His 2018 discovery of the currently known biggest prime has 24,862,048 digits. These enormous primes have a name. Mega primes. 
megaprimes, or primes with at least 1 million digits. Now, this is unfathomably large. Nothing in our physical universe can even come close to describing a tiny fraction of these numbers. But still, we found quite a respectable number of these. As of August 3rd, 2022, we have found 1,502 megaprimes according to the prime pages list of the 5,000 largest primes. Pretty impressive, but how? I mean, if these numbers are so large, how can we find so many of these mega primes? Now, obviously, we don't just go one by one looking at each number and testing if it has no factors. Instead, certain forms of numbers have patterns and properties that can help us find their primality much easier. The biggest, and perhaps the most famous, is the Mersenne prime. Mersenne primes are primes in the form of 2 to the n minus 1 for some natural number n. For example, La Roche's prime is 2 to the 82 million, 589,933 minus 1. Okay, well, what about this form helps us find primes? First, if n is composite, then 2 to the n minus 1 is also composite. Why? Well, since n is composite, let's say n equals a times b for positive integers a, b not equal to 1. So we have 2 to the a, b minus 1. This can be rewritten as 2 to the a minus 1 times 1 plus 2 to the a plus 2 to the 2a plus 2 to the 3a plus all the way to 2 to the b minus 1a. This works because when we distribute, everything cancels out except for 2 to the a, b, and negative 1. So, if n is composite, then 2 to the a, b, minus 1 is divisible by 2 to the a, minus 1, making 2 to the n, minus 1, composite as well. This also means that n can only be prime when 2 to the n, minus 1 is prime. So, we actually only need to test n values that are also prime, since composite n's never result in a prime Mersenne number. So, what's stopping us from putting bigger and bigger prime numbers as n? Well, hold on a moment. We found that if 2 to the n minus 1 is prime, then n is prime. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if n is prime, 2 to the n minus 1 is prime. For example, 11 is prime, but 2 to the 11 minus 1 is 2047, which is 23 times 89. So, we need a definite 100% primality test for 2 to the n minus 1 for some prime n. To do so, we use what's called the Lucas Lemur test. It's actually quite simple. First, we define a sequence that starts with 4. The next number in the sequence will be 4 squared minus 2, which is 14. Then we continue to 14 squared minus 2, which is 194, and so on. The test confirms that 2 to the n minus 1 is prime if and only if the n minus 1th number in our sequence is a multiple of 2 to the n minus 1. That's pretty cool, but here's the thing. Our sequence gets pretty big pretty fast. I mean, it goes 4, 14, 194, and then 37,634, then 1,416,317,954. With our n values being in the millions, we can't just compute the sequence to whatever n we want. Thankfully, we're only really focusing on the remainder here, so we can use the modulo operation to ease things a little bit. The expression a mod b refers to the remainder when a is divided by b. So to prove 2 to the n minus 1 is prime, we want to show that the n minus 1th value in our sequence, s sub n minus 1, mod 2 to the n minus 1 is 0. Now we can simplify this using the identity a times b mod m is equal to a mod m times b mod m mod m. Now if a equals b, then really we have a squared mod m is equal to a mod m squared mod m. So instead of squaring again and again, and then calculating the remainder at the n minus 1th value of the sequence, we can find the remainder at each step and then square it at each step. For example, Let's try to prove that 2 to the 7 minus 1 is prime. Now, the sixth value in our original sequence has 19 digits, which isn't terrible, but let's use our other method. 2 to the 7 minus 1 is 127, so we're just doing mod 127. 
the first entry of our sequence is 4, then it's 14, then it's 194, but we can just find a remainder right now instead of squaring immediately, so that's 67. Then we do 67 squared minus 2, which is 4,487. The remainder of that is 42. 42 squared minus 2 is 1,762, and the remainder we get is 111. We do 111 squared minus 2, and that's 12,319. That's the sixth and final number in our sequence. 12,319 mod 127 is in fact 0. So yeah, 2 to the 7 minus 1 is indeed prime. Now, this test is great for proving primality, but it takes a lot of computing power and softwares like GIMPs has their fair share of errors. But there's another test that helps us find potential primes with much less errors. It's called the Fermat Probable Prime Test. It finds probable primes, or PRPs, which are most likely primes. This allows us to have a smaller pool of possible prime numbers that have a better chance of actually being prime. So how does this work? First, we have to talk about Fermat's little theorem. This theorem states that if p is a prime number, then for any integer a, the number a to the p minus a is an integer multiple of p. In modular arithmetic, this means that a to the p is congruent to a mod p. Now, this isn't to be confused with the related but different modulo operation that we used before. When we say that a is congruent to b mod n, that means n is the divisor of their difference. So a minus b divided by n is an integer. And this modulo n isn't an operation as much as the system of the entire equation. Anyways, if a is not divisible by p, then Fermat's little theorem also says that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. In other words, a to the p minus 1 minus 1 is divisible by p. So for any integer n, if we calculate a to the n minus 1 mod n, and the result is not 1 mod n, then n is composite. Otherwise, n might be prime. So we call this a weak probable prime of base a. Those PRPs that are composite are called pseudoprimes. Now, the bigger our numbers, the less pseudoprimes there are, and the numbers we want, these megaprimes, are so large that it's essentially guaranteed that if we get a PRP, it's probably going to be prime. But it's not a proof. Pseudoprimes still exist, and in fact, there are an infinite number of them for every base a is greater than 1. So we do have to do another primality test once we get a PRP. But still, PRPs are more efficient because they have lower error rates and easier double checking methods. So GIMPs uses both PRPs and Lucas Lemur tests in conjunction to find big Mersenne primes. That was a lot of technical math stuff. And while it's not necessary to know, I mean, anyone can just download the program and potentially find prime numbers, I think it's fascinating that we can devise these clever methods to quickly find numbers that are unfathomably large. And by the way, this entire process doesn't only find big Mersenne primes. You see, there's a theorem in number theory called the Euclid-Euler theorem. It talks about a type of number called perfect numbers. A perfect number is simply a positive integer that is equal to the sum of its positive divisors, excluding the number itself. So 6 is perfect because its factors, excluding 6, are 1, 2, and 3. And 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6. So perfect numbers are pretty cool, but what's even cooler is its connection to Mersenne primes. Yeah. The Euclid-Euler theorem states that an even number is perfect if and only if it has the form 2 to the p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1, where, you guessed it, 2 to the p minus 1 is a Mersenne prime. And because of this if and only if relation, if you find any perfect number, you will find a unique corresponding Mersenne prime. And if you find a Mersenne prime, you will find a unique corresponding perfect number. For example, 6 corresponds to the Mersenne prime 3, or 2 to the 2 minus 1, and 2 to the 2 minus 1 times 2 to the 2 minus 1 is 2 times 3, or 6. So, once you find a big Mersenne prime through GIMPs or whatever other prime searching program, you've also discovered a big even perfect number. It's pretty cool. 
And while we don't know if there are infinitely many even perfect numbers or MRSA and primes, since there's exactly the same number of even perfect numbers and MRSA and primes, we only need to prove the finiteness or infiniteness of one of these to prove for both. Now, we've talked about MRSA and primes a lot since they're the biggest and the most popular of these big primes, but there are a lot of different prime forms out there. PrimeGrid is a website that allows you to look for a lot of these different types of primes. For example, there's the prof prime, which is of the form k times 2 to the n plus 1 for positive integers k and n, where k is odd and k is less than 2 to the n. The biggest prof prime is 10,233 times 2 to the 31,172,165 plus 1, currently the ninth largest prime discovered. There's also the generalized Fermat primes of the form a to the 2 to the n plus 1 for positive integers a and n. The largest generalized Fermat prime is 1,059,094 to the 1,048,576 plus 1, currently the 16th largest prime discovered. You can even look for arithmetic progression of primes, which are sequences of primes with a common difference between every prime in the sequence. For example, this is an AP21, or an arithmetic progression of 21 primes for n values from 0 to 20. In fact, I actually discovered this AP21 using prime grid. So what? I mean, sure, prime numbers are pretty cool, but who cares? Cicadas. Cicadas live the vast majority of their lives underground until they emerge, fly and breed and die in a few weeks. Certain species of cicadas have an interesting pattern in how long they burrow. 13 or 17 years. Prime numbers. It's theorized that this unusual length of breeding cycles helps avoid predators. The lack of divisors for prime numbers mean that the reproductive cycles of predators will rarely coincide with that of the cicadas. But also, we care. Cryptography uses the properties of primes and prime factorization for secure data transmission. Even the purest branch of mathematics, number theory, and primes, they're embedded into our day-to-day -day lives. In 1940, British mathematician G. H. Hardy wrote in his A Mathematician's Apology that, quote, no one has yet discovered any warlike purpose to be served by the theory of numbers or relativity, and it seems very unlikely that anyone will do so for many years. Yet today, we use prime numbers to hide information from those we don't trust, and cicadas use prime numbers to hide from predators. It's a tough world out there. But that's okay. Because the process of studying primes, the algorithms, the theorems, and the immensity of the discoveries of these numbers that's grand on its own. These numbers are amazingly huge, indescribable, even if there were universes within every particle in our observable universe. But that's just it. We've discovered and described them. Just like how we marvel at the stars, light years away, bright active galactic nucleus in the center of galaxies, and supernovas formed by dying stars in their grandeur and vastness and luminosity, we search for the curiosity, for the glory, the spirit of discovery, the immensity. So keep looking. Maybe you won't find something as rare and grand as the next biggest prime number, but simply that process, that curiosity and drive makes us all just a little bit more smarter. Until next time.